seated. Open up to Esther this evening, Book of Esther. That should give you a good idea of what feast we're going to be looking at here this evening. Last week, we looked at Hanukkah. Hanukkah, of course, is a, it's, it's not laid out for us in Scripture how it is celebrated, but it is, it was celebrated by Jesus in John chapter 10. It talks about that. And we kind of looked at all of the, the surrounding uh, truth that we can gather from that. Hanukkah is actually going on right now. It ends tomorrow. It will be the last day of Hanukkah for this year. But tonight we're going to bring our examination of the Feasts of Israel to a close. We will have looked at all seven of the Levitical feasts and then the two non-Levitical feasts but that are mentioned or alluded to in Scripture our examination of Purim begins with Esther. Esther is one of two books of scripture named after women. And Esther is notable for who is not mentioned in the book of Esther by name. God. God is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther by name. But the book of Esther is certainly one of the best examples of God's sovereignty in all of Scripture. You can't get through the book of Esther without seeing the fingerprints of God, even though he is not mentioned by name in its pages. For the setting of the Feast of Purim and the book of Esther, let me give you just a, a quick backup of a few hundred years here. Nebuchadnezzar conquered the southern kingdom of Judah in two stages. You read in Daniel chapter 1 that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and he besieged Jerusalem. That's when he took away captives. He took away Daniel and his three friends. We know them best as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though the Bible says their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were taken captive in 606 B.C. And then the, the kingdom of Judah still had kind of a puppet king who was, he held his, his throne really at the good pleasure of Nebuchadnezzar. But in 587 B.C., the whole kingdom was taken into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar sent in his troops and they leveled the temple. This would be Solomon's temple. They leveled the temple. They took captive much uh, most of the, the inhabitants of Israel and took them back to Babylon. Daniel 5 records the Babylonian Empire being overthrown by the Medes, led by Darius I, and the Persians, led by Cyrus. Daniel 5 is the story of Belshazzar's feast. You remember, he had a drunken party where they were drinking wine out of the vessels from the temple that had been taken from the service of Jehovah, and in the middle of his party, do you remember what happened? The finger of God came down and started writing on the wall, and nobody could read it. And so the queen said, I think, I remember hearing about a guy named Daniel. And they brought Daniel in. This would have been, Daniel would have been a much older man by this point. He, not, not a teenager by any stretch. A very mature man comes in. He explains the, the, the meaning of the words on the wall. It meant that you've been weighed and found wanting and your kingdom has been divided and it's going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, the Medo-Persian Empire came in and swept through Babylon. That was 539 B.C. King Cyrus was the one who led the Persian half of the Medo-Persian army that came in. Cyrus was a good king. He was mentioned by Isaiah the prophet hundreds of years before his birth. He was mentioned in Isaiah by name, and he wasn't born yet. That's, that's pretty significant. But he was mentioned, he was the one who allowed the Jews to return to the land of Israel. Cyrus allowed the Jews to return. Under Zerubbabel, 49,897 Jews returned to the land of Israel. We read about this in the book of Ezra. They returned back to the land of uh, and the rest of the Jews remained in Persia. That's significant. That's what brings us to the book of Esther. That's why the book of Esther kind of makes sense. Four, almost 50, we'll round up the last 120-some. <coughs> almost 50,000 went back to Israel. All the rest stay in Persia. Because why would they stay in Persia, do you think? Safety. Safety. 
They'd been there for 70 years. They're pretty well established. They had established themselves. Many of them had jobs. Many of them had homes. They weren't, they weren't in slavery in Persia. So it wasn't a, necessarily a terrible situation under which they were living. Following the death of Cyrus, the kingdom of Persia came to be ruled by the man who we see here in Esther, chapter 1, verse 1. His name is Ahasuerus. History refers to this king as Xerxes I. If you're familiar with history or if you enjoy the, the study of warfare, perhaps you're familiar with the 300 Spartans who held the pass at Thermopylae. Well, the 300 Spartans were fighting the thousands of warriors that were thrown against them by Xerxes I, or Ahasuerus, the husband of Esther. Ahasuerus' queen, in the beginning of the book of Esther, was a young woman named Vashti. Ahasuerus throws a week-long feast for all of his nobles, and on the seventh day, in an act of drunken pride, he says that he wants his queen brought in to show the people her beauty. She, for whatever reason, we don't know exactly what her reasoning was, if it was pride or if she was trying to make a point, or we, we don't have anything there, but she refused. She said, I'm not coming, and because of that, she was deposed from her position as queen. She was not executed. At least not that we have recorded. But after a time, the king began to miss his queen, but he couldn't recall her because there was a rule with the laws of the Medes and the Persians that once a decree was made, it could not be reversed. It couldn't be recalled. I don't know who came up with that idea, but that is a very dumb way to run, to run a country. But that's how they did. When once the order goes out, you can't... You can't recall. You can't say, well, no, I, I didn't mean that. So the, the queen is gone, and there's nothing that can be done to bring her back. So all of the young ladies of the kingdom, which is a massive kingdom, he ruled from India to Ethiopia. That's a massive swath of territory. All of the women were chosen uh, to come in, and they were gathered together. And from this pool of eligible young ladies... King Ahasuerus was set to choose his new bride. It is far less, um, far less romantic than the cartoons would make it. One of these days I'll preach through the book of Esther and we'll lay out exactly what happened. We would consider this, what happened, we would consider to be a barbaric and a debauched process. It was not in any way, shape, or form a beautiful romance. Okay, now, eventually... <laughs> They did come to like each other, but Esther was the one who was chosen, although she was not known as Esther. The sovereign hand of God was working, and a woman was chosen to replace Vashti as the queen of Persia. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah. Hadassah was the cousin of a man named Mordecai. And when she was elevated to be queen, her cousin, who she treated more as an uncle, he had raised her, told her to keep her identity as a Jewess secret. He said, don't tell anybody. Just take your place. And so she did not go by the name of Hadassah. She went by the name of Esther, which is a Persian word. Uh, a Persian name was how she came into power. Chapter 3, verse 1. I'm not going to read all of Esther for you here tonight. Just kind of trying to summarize Chapter 3, verse 1, after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. I think it's worth pausing here. We don't know anything about Hamadatha, his father, but we do know a little bit that he was an Agagite. Where have you heard the name Agag before? Well, if you remember, you heard it back in 1 Samuel 15. When King Saul was told by God to go and annihilate the Amalekite peoples. And he didn't. He went and he annihilated most of them. But he kept for himself, he kept the best of the sheep and the oxen. And he spared the Amalekite king whose name happened to be Agag. And it would appear that this would be a descendant of that same Agag, 500 years later, in another kingdom, in another country, with completely different circumstances, the consequences of King Saul's disobedience come to the front once more. Haman, 
is we would call him kind of the prime minister. He's, he's in a very, very high position within the government there of Persia. A proud man, and all of the king's servants bowed before him, all except one. Can you guess who didn't bow? Well, it was Mordecai, the uncle or the cousin of Esther. This refusal to bow sparked a deep <laughs> hatred, not just for Mordecai, but Haman decided that he hated not just Mordecai, but also Mordecai's people. He decided that the best way to solve this would not be just to get rid of Mordecai, but to exterminate the entire race. You look at verse 6 there of chapter 3. A plan of such magnitude would require kingly permission. You don't get to just go out and commit genocide on a whim. So he goes to the king and he lays this out. He has to sell the idea of a Jewish holocaust to King Xerxes or Ahasuerus. So he goes and he, he spells all of this stuff out, but something happens before he goes in. Before he goes to the king to seek his approval, he decides he wants to get a date. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure. There, there's the first kind of hint at Purim right there. They cast Purim, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So now he has the date that he's going to go and he's going to approach the king and he's going to try to sell or, or, or Ahasuerus, hey, let's exterminate this people We'll do it on this particular day that was chosen by the casting of lots, and Haman volunteers to pay for it. But look at his reasoning in verse 8. And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Where, where did the Jews get their law from? <laughs> they got it from God. They're abiding by the laws of Moses. Their laws are different. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them, in other to suffer them to live. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. The king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. He believes in this Holocaust so much that he's willing to foot the bill for it. He says, I will pay for this if we can just have these Jews exterminated. Word of Haman's plot becomes public knowledge and the Jews descend into a panic because on this particular day, it's going to be open season on the Jews. The way that it works is whoever kills the Jew gets all of his stuff. So they know that there's going to be a tide coming against them very, very soon. Mordecai sent word to Esther that it was time for her to reveal her heritage, to plead before her husband on behalf of her people. It's here with this context that we look at chapter 4, verse 14, that says, For if thou, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther. He's trying to tell her, look, you need to go in before your husband. He says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. How could he be so sure of that? How could, how could Mordecai know that, Esther, you should go talk, but if you don't talk, then deliverance will come from somewhere else. How could Mordecai be so certain that the Jews would make it? Because he, he, Yeah, he's got God's promise on it. Because God told mm -hmm. Abraham that there, through him there would be the land, the seed, and ultimately the blessing. And the blessing hasn't come. So Mordecai says, look, if you don't do it, then deliverance will come from somewhere else. He goes on, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? There's no coincidence here. There's no, there's no happenstance. God put Esther where she was at just this time. And though forbidden by the law of the Persians, <laughs> Esther approached the throne of her husband without his bidding. He extended to her the, the scepter that would indicate that it was okay. He allowed her to, to come before him, and she invited him to a banquet. At that banquet, she invited him to another banquet. And it wasn't just that she had invited the king, her husband. She had also invited Haman. 
And so Haman, she has her husband and her mortal enemy come. Only at the second banquet did Esther reveal her nationality to her husband and identify Haman as her mortal enemy and the mortal enemy of her people. Haman ended up being hung on the very gallows that he had constructed to hang Mordecai upon. But the decree that Haman had given had already gone out. And remember what we said about Persian decrees. They can't be withdrawn. Ahasuerus can't say, oh, by the way, scratch that. Uh, Jews are fine. That decree has gone out. So they can't, they can't pull it back. Rather, they're going to have to countermand that decree. Mordecai is given Haman's old position. And so Mordecai writes a different, uh, a, a different decree that's going to go out. Pick up with me in Esther chapter 8. I know we're skipping over, but I, I, I believe you're fairly familiar with the story of Esther. Esther 8, verse 9 says, Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is, the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and hundred and twenty-seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. Anything significant about that verse? That's the longest verse in the Bible, right there. It's, that's Esther 8, 9. The longest verse is part of, of Mordecai's decree. It's, it's going out that way. Verse 10, and he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' his name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent by post on horseback and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day, the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all the people, that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So what is Mordecai's decree? Haman sends out a decree that says, hey, it's open season. On this day, it's open season on all the Jews. If you kill them, you get their stuff. Mordecai sends out a, a countermanding order that says any Jews, the, the Jews are more than welcome to band together. Anybody who tries to attack them, the Jews are to wipe them out and the Jews get all of their stuff. Hmm. Oh, Guess what happened to the enthusiasm? It, it would have declined a good bit. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to fight against people who have a, a mandate to fight back. The day that would have been set as a holocaust of the Jews ended up being two days in which the Jews destroyed their enemies. See, they on the day that Haman's order would have been carried out, the Jews killed lots. They killed 500 people just within the city of Susa, which was where the capital was. But at the end of that day, Esther came to the king. She said, king, there's still more. We need tomorrow too. And so they extended the, the open season, if you want to call it that, on the enemies of the Jews. They had two days, and the Jewish people wiped off all of those who had come against them. Look at Esther 9.26. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Purim. Therefore, for all the words of this letter, and that which they had seen concerning this matter, and that which, had, that which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them, and upon their seed, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they should keep these two days, according to their writing, according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation and every family, every province and every city, and that the days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. The Feast of Purim has been going on year after year since Mordecai signed that decree that went out, that reversed, or countermanded the evil order of Haman. On the Jewish calendar, Purim is celebrated on the 14th of Adar. This year, 2023, 
The Feast of Purim was celebrated on March 7th, and in 2024, it'll be celebrated on March 24th. Again, there's the, <laughs> the wide span because of the lunar solar calendar that they keep. Today, the Feast of Purim is one of the, one of the fun holidays for the Jews. The kids really get involved in this. I think, Deb, you did a Sunday school lesson or a children's church on this not that long ago. On the day when they celebrate Purim, they come in and the elders of the synagogue will read the entire book of Esther. They'll go over. You see there you've got ten chapters. The tenth is just a couple verses. But they'll read all of the book of Esther. And well, the children will dress up. They'll act out portions. But every time the name of Haman is mentioned in the story of Esther... All of the kids will start yelling, boo, and they have noisemakers, and they try to drown out the noise of Haman. It's, it's kind of, again, kind of a fun time for them. They eat cookies called Haman Tashin, which translates roughly to Haman's ears. Uh, and they have these little cookies, and they're a, a particular shape and a particular recipe that they make. They send gifts, they send charity to the poor, and they have a Purim meal as well. So it's Again, it's one of the fun holidays that the Jews celebrate on, a, on an annual basis. As we looked at many of the other feasts of Israel, there's a certain solemnity to them. There's a seriousness. But when it comes to Purim, even though it certainly marks a very uh, solemn occasion in which they were delivered, they still have a good time with it. What about Jesus and Purim? Well... If you turn to John 5, you don't have to because I'll just read it to you. It's a very short verse. It says, in John 5, verse 1, it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. If you look at John 5, and I'll let you do it on your own time, but if you read John 5 and if you read John 4, you can put together the calendar, and it could really only be the feast of Purim that he was celebrating in John chapter 5, verse 1. Just the way that uh, the feast, we can tell usually what time of year different events in the life of Jesus happened because of the feasts that were being celebrated and different things like that. Really, the only feast that could be celebrated there. So scholars believe that Jesus did celebrate the Feast of Purim. Jesus, of course, being a Jew, would have celebrated the Feast of Purim. So what do we get from this? Because I'm not Jewish. I don't celebrate the Feast of Purim on a regular basis. I want to bring it to your attention that history is filled with examples of people who've tried to annihilate the Jews. This comes as no surprise to you. Pharaoh tried to do it. Haman tried to do it. We talked last week about Antiochus Epiphanes, the guy, the Greek who tried to do it. Hitler tried to do it. Hamas has tried to do it most recently. Those who try to destroy Israel end up being destroyed themselves, and Israel always seems to get a new dessert or a new holiday out of the deal. If you <laughs> notice that, when it came to Antiochus Epiphanes, they started eating their latkes. And when it comes to Haman, they're eating Haman's ears. The story of Purim, especially, should remind us not only of God's protection of his people, but also of the non-existence of coincidence. There's a lot of people, they feel like, well, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen. No. God is in control. God is sovereignly working all things together for his will. We've talked about God's will on Sunday mornings an awful lot. God is working all things together. Though he's not mentioned in the book of Esther by name, God's fingerprints are just all over that story. It wasn't coincidence that put Esther in her position or Mordecai in his position. And it wasn't coincidence that the lot, the pure, fell on the date, the 14th of Adar. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. If God is in, in control of something so insignificant as the roll of a dice, which is what the casting of lots is, God is truly in control of everything. Christians have not replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. I've mentioned that many times. But if we have accepted Christ, then we are made children of God. And God is intimately involved in the details of our lives. He's continually working, often in ways that we won't know until we're in his presence. He's working continually to ensure that all things, according to Romans 8.28, 
that all things work together, not only for our good, but for his glory. And so as with all of the feasts that we've looked at, beginning with the ones in Leviticus, all the way up to Hanukkah and Purim, we don't celebrate them necessarily. There's nothing wrong if you have a, have a fancy to celebrate Purim. Knock yourself out. There's nothing unbiblical about it. But we would do well to look over our lives on a consistent basis and be thankful. I look back on my life and I can see where God has given me protection, given me provision, and guided my steps, just as he did for Esther, Mordecai, and the entire Jewish nation. 